So this week, uh, we will share data that has some hope in it, <clears throat> but it's hope that requires a commitment. The third wave of COVID cases appears to be cresting now. The strain on our hospitals will continue for some time. If we keep our commitment to getting our case numbers down, we can sustain our health system, and we can look towards a new normal that is hopefully better than the one we left when the pandemic started. All of us are doing this together, in the decision to stay home, to stay away from work when you're feeling ill, in the decision to wear a mask when we are out. If you run a business, this curve is turning around because you're helping your employees to stay home when they're sick, because you're keeping your workplace safe, or, as hard as it is, closed. Vaccination is increasing in our hotspots and has just been announced. Doubling down on this commitment means the cases will come down faster. So thank you. So there's clear reason for hope, but this hope requires a commitment, a dead set determination to see the job through. It requires staying the course and making sure that we make the third wave the last wave, that we control spread so that our vaccination efforts have time to take hold. So the three key messages in the data we will share today. First, many countries and jurisdictions have been here before. It's tempting to relax when the numbers start to turn your way, but it will not work. This is the time to commit to getting them down, to setting goals towards which you can work, to making hope the basis of a commitment to get on top of this disease rather than the excuse to relax. We still have a long journey in front of us, and please know that the way down will be slower than the way up, particularly for our hospitals. So while we've had a good start, it's nothing more than that. We cannot afford a fourth wave, and we cannot let the new variants into our system at such a challenging time. This means we need to restrict movement into and around the province. The second thing I take from these data is that we, Ontarians, actually have the power to turn the tide of this pandemic. The third wave isn't cresting on its own, you are making it happen. It's happening because of our daily choices together. That's important. And as we continue to make these decisions that protect all of us, we give the vaccination campaign time to succeed. I want to note as well, though, that these are very hard decisions, and they're harder for some populations that have to go to work, our essential workers. And so we should never forget that it's not just about choice, it's also about the circumstances that people face in day-to-day -day lives. Finally, you'll see how the impact of COVID-19 is as enormous as we describe it, and it does stretch beyond just patients with the disease. Our healthcare system is no longer functioning normally. We're taking the most critically ill patients, we're putting them in helicopters and into ambulances, and moving them across the province because we're searching for beds. Nurses and doctors are attending to patients in field hospitals. We are now backlogged a quarter of a million surgeries. I'm grateful for the providers from across Ontario and across Canada, We've rallied to help our most challenged hospitals. It's important to note that this is an incredibly challenging time for our health system, and that has not changed, even with a crest in the case numbers. Other stories have shown this week how ruthless COVID-19 can be. We have to be equally ruthless with this disease, and we need to commit to getting our numbers down once and for all, using all the available means at our disposal. We know what to do now, and it's starting to stick. It's starting to work. And this can give us all hope. The key thing now is to stick with it. We have the power to end this pandemic if we stay committed to the course. But before we get into the numbers, I do want to add one more important thing for Ontarians. We are as worried about the missing patient as we are about the wave of COVID-19 patients in our hospitals. We know that there are people who need care, uh, who need to be in hospital, who aren't coming, people who need urgent attention. While it's true that our hospitals aren't functioning normally, they're still able to care for patients who need urgent help. To be clear, it's not safer to stay at home when you need help, even now. If you need a hospital, please get to a hospital. With all that, let's get into the numbers. And my apologies, as we uh, move into the presentation, the uh, sign language translation will disappear. It'll return immediately uh, following the presentation. Great. So let's start with the key findings. Uh, as I said by, uh, in the introductory comments, uh, the efforts of Ontarians are making a difference. Cases are cresting, but they're cresting at a very high level. ICU occupancy is at record highs and continues to climb, and our system is under incredible pressure, unlike it's ever faced before. Workplace mobility is still too high. Limiting essential workplaces and keeping sick workers at home will help control cases. 
Clearing the surgical backlog will be an enormous challenge. Vaccination distribution is more equitable because it is focusing on hotspots. Continuing this progress and increasing the vaccination rates in our hardest hit communities uh, will be essential to progress. Ontarians can make outdoor activities safer with distancing and masking when close to those outside their household. Indoor activities, I want to remind people, pose a significant risk. So let's uh, look as we uh, start as we always do by looking at uh, case rates across public health units in the province. You can see that cases are flattening, but pockets of growth do remain in hotspots. And this level of growth in some cases is still exponential, and that's the type of growth that can explode very, very quickly. Uh, you can see here that there are an increasing number of public health units, although still not the majority, uh, that are reducing their cases. Uh, and I should point out as well that the case rate right now is still very high, what we consider well above the uh, controller red level in the province. Uh, for those of you who've been looking at the recent or are interested in the recent reproduction numbers, the tendency or the uh, likelihood that someone passes the case on to other people, it's about, point zero, it's about 0 0.9 right now. So that means that we're starting to see a deceleration. We're starting to see a cresting in the number of cases. But important to keep in mind as well that the number of cases is still very, very high. Here we're showing test positivity rates, the proportion of tests uh, that are positive. Uh, these are still very high uh, across Ontario. Uh, you can see that it's about 8.9% uh, when we calculated the chart earlier in the week. Uh, it's a fairly consistent at this level, and this again is a very high level of positivity. This is above what we would have considered before, above the red or control zone, so it's a very high level of positivity. So high case rates, high positivity rates, uh, and if you look here on this slide, uh, testing rates are flat or a little bit down. So we always look at three numbers when we look at the current state of the pandemic. Uh, we look at the number of cases, uh, we look at the uh, percent positivity, and we look at the testing rates. And so cases are flat, uh, positivity is high or uh, maybe up a little bit at times, and testing is flat or a little bit down. All this means is that the current plateau is very precarious. This is the place where you can either start to drive down the pandemic, drive down the case rates, re drive down the number of hospitalizations, drive down the number of admissions to ICU, and drive down the number of deaths. Or if we see a change, as we've seen in the past, uh, you can see substantial uh, exponential growth in the cases and really a continuation of the third wave or a fourth wave. Continuing on here, uh, you can see the proportion of cases, which are variants, uh, the orange part of the graph represents the cases that are uh, variant-driven cases, predominantly the B117 variant, which is the variant uh, initially identified in the United Kingdom. Um, as you can see, uh, and as predicted, the proportion of cases that are variants is exceedingly high. It's now more than 90% of all cases are a variant, a new variant uh, in the province. Although most of them are B117, uh, the prevalence of the other variants, the ones that were first identified in South Africa uh, or Brazil, uh, are increasing. And we have seen uh, now in this country the variant that was first identified in India. Um, I think it's important to point out that as new variants emerge, it's critical to keep control over uh, the entry or restrict entry into the province so that we control the entry uh, and the spread of potentially uh, more dangerous variants that could be vaccine escapees. Let me go on to now to mobility. Uh, mobility uh, within your community uh, is really a, re a marker uh, of risk behavior. It's not an uh, exact sort of correlate or, or, cause, it, uh, cause, or uh, cause, I should say, sorry, uh, of case spread, but it's a marker of high risk behavior. What's good here is that mobility has come down substantially. This is overall mobility. Uh, you can see a dotted line on the chart. That's the mobility threshold. Uh, the rate of mobility or the level of mobility at which we think it's necessary to be below to drive down case rates. Uh, you can see that mobility here has now crossed that threshold, and that's what's helping create the crest in cases and hopefully a decline in the number of cases. Uh, I will say that it was uh, steadily down uh, when we calculated this a little earlier in the week. Uh, the data from today looks like it might be slightly up, so it's important to consistently and constantly try to keep this mobility uh, limited as well to try to uh, keep case numbers down. Here you can see three different types of mobility. I think it's really important to note that um, retail and recreation, uh, transit mobility, those have had very, very clear drops, but workplace-related mobility remains too high. 
And reducing this mobility will help us further drive down overall mobility and help us further drive down uh, case rates as well. And if you just look at the pattern here, you can see that on the uh, latter two, the middle and the right-hand side panel, uh, we've driven down mobility close to uh, where we were uh, during the January uh, lockdown. You can see that workplace mobility remains higher and uh, still creates a, a threat to controlling the disease. Now, moving on to the case rates, uh, you can see here that cases are decreasing earlier and faster than projected, which is good news. But we'll only reach February levels under the best case. If you look at each of the row uh, lines here, you'll see a different set of assumptions. And I should note that these are uh, representative cases. Uh, we work through uh, five different uh, models uh, put together by different modeling groups across the province. Each of them run multiple scenarios with different uh, assumptions. And we try to give a consensus or coherent sort of uh, idea of what the different scenarios present. The red line is where we would have been uh, had we not had the stay-at-home order. And so you can see that there has been substantial control over cases uh, because of the stay-at-home order. Uh, right now, the uh, list of uh, assumptions uh, that really define that mid-case, that yellow line, is about where we are. And current progress or current or last sort of uh, seven-day average for a few days is just below that yellow line, suggesting that it's probably a fairly good prediction where we are at about 1% uh, decrease every day. The green line uh, is uh, where we have strong effective sick pay, a short list of essential workplaces, lower mobility, uh, and a continued focus on vaccinating high-risk communities. Uh, one of the things that we'll have to continue to understand is how vaccination increases. Uh, any increase in vaccination will help drive down numbers. Uh, it's important to come and understand how behavior holds or doesn't hold during the pandemic. That'll also determine where these go. Uh, but you can see that if we start to relax public health measures uh, after, say, six uh, weeks uh, that would have started on April 8th, you can see there is a potential for an increase in cases again, which could be quite dangerous given that our uh, ICUs have not yet uh, started to uh, empty out in any way. I want to try to drive to home this point here. Uh, if you look at this chart, which we show uh, every time, uh, the orange lines are the hospitalizations uh, with COVID-19, uh, and the red lines, that sort of lower level, is our patients in intensive care units with COVID-related critical illness. And whereas you see the crest of the second wave coming back down, and then the start of the third wave, there's no decrease really after the second wave in intensive care unit occupancy. And that's why as this new wave uh, hit and started to uh, rise up, you really saw the intensive care unit occupancy building off of not a low level like we would have had during the summer, but a much higher level uh, that had been a result of the second wave. And so we know that uh, care in the intensive care units will uh, persist for a while, and it's this uh, occupancy of our intensive care units which is such a significant threat to currently uh, to our health system. Going on, uh, here you can see the uh, projections on ICU occupancy. Uh, although uh, cases are lower than we expected, ICU occupancy is still on track uh, for the projections. And unfortunately, that does take us or keep us above 800 for a while. Uh, under the best case assumptions, it starts to come down to about 500 uh, by the end of May. Uh, to perhaps uh, just a little bit under 800 by the uh, end of May if we're on a moderate or sort of the middle case set of assumptions. Uh, it's important to note that that's still a very high level and may not be sufficient, unlikely to be sufficient to restart uh, surgeries in a significant way as we move along. Moving on, just talking to the issue of transfers, uh, you can see that there has been a dramatic rise in transfers uh, between hospitals uh, over the last two uh, reporting periods. Uh, this really uh, reflects two phenomena. It reflects patients who need to be sent uh, to another hospital than the uh, hospital that they arrived at in order to get the care that they need. It also reflects an intentional movement of patients to create capacity in the hardest hit communities, in the hospitals in the hardest hit communities. So this really reflects kind of the state of the system where we've got multiple transfers, uh, where we've heard uh, in different stories over the last little while, patients being moved uh, to much different parts of the province, uh, sick families being split up. Uh, and this is likely to continue for a while while ICU occupancy uh, remains at such a high level. Uh, we also report on this figure each week. This is the current surgical backlog, and it presents an enormous challenge. Uh, as you can see here, the current surgical backlog is over a quarter of a million cases right now. Uh, and it's important to note that this is really one of the waves that will uh, hit our health system as the backlog needs to be dealt with. Uh, there's also the backlog from missed screening, which we talked about in earlier briefings. 
Uh, there's the backlog from increased chronic disease uh, around increased unemployment that's happened during the pandemic. Uh, and there is the backlog uh, that will happen from increased mental health and addiction challenges, uh, which uh, may be hard for us to estimate right now, but uh, as we've documented in previous briefings, are significant challenges. Moving on to vaccination uh, and some good news on vaccination. Uh, when we uh, did this slide earlier on in the week, it was four and a half million doses administered. It's now close to 4.7, or around, I should say, uh, 4.7 million doses. Coverage in people 80 plus is very high. Uh, coverage in people 70 to 79 has increased substantially. The dark blue part of each of these figures represents people who have received at least a first dose. Uh, the light blue uh, really reflects people who have made an appointment for the vaccination. Uh, yellow reflects people who are still waiting to be vaccinated or who have not uh, signed up for an appointment or have not uh, received one. Uh, you can see it's improving as well in the 60 to 69 age category. Still a long way to go, though, in 50 to 59, and obviously under 50, uh, still very uh, low, although improving levels of vaccination. And this is an area where we're starting to see uh, trends in the right way. If we vaccinate in the hardest hit neighborhoods, if we prioritize the neighborhoods that have the highest incidence of disease, we know that we will help control uh, disease in these communities. We know that we'll help to control disease across the entire province, and we know that we'll help to make uh, some uh, aspects of the pandemic a bit more uh, equitable. Uh, and as you can see here, it has changed uh, since the first briefing where we showed this chart. Uh, in the first briefing, the difference between the top, the highest incidence community, uh, and the lowest incidence community was about three and a half fold. And this means that if you were living in one of the lowest uh, risk communities in the uh, lowest incidence community, you're about three and a half times more likely to get a vaccine than if you were living in, a, in the highest risk community. You can see that those numbers are roughly comparable. And that trend needs to continue so that you see that the people who live in the highest risk communities uh, have the highest level uh, of vaccination by far. You're starting to see some of this trend in the age group between 50 and 69. Uh, this is positive and this is a trend that needs to be reinforced uh, and encouraged as we go, uh, go through control of the pandemic. I want to finish off uh, the uh, new slides uh, today really talking about the fact that outdoor settings are safer about a 20-fold uh, lower risk to be outside. But it's still important to take precautions when outside. Uh, if you are outdoors and you can physically distance from other people uh, who are not in your household, uh, you probably don't need to wear a mask. But if you can't, uh, then you do need to wear a mask. And so if you're out for a walk in a park with your own household, you can effectively physically distance from other uh, households. Probably okay not to be wearing a mask. Uh, but if you're, say, on a playground, it's important to try to wear a mask to make sure that uh, you prevent the transmission of these highly, highly, highly transmissible uh, variants. So back to the key findings. Uh, cases are cresting right now, but they're cresting at a very high level. Uh, ICU occupancy is at record highs and continues to climb, and our system is under incredible pressure right now. Uh, work meds, workplace mobility is too high. Limiting essential workplaces and keeping sick workers at home will help control cases. Clearing the surgical backlog will be an enormous challenge. Vaccination distribution is more equitable because it's focusing on hotspots and it's more effective. There's no trade-off here. Continuing this progress is essential. And Ontarians can make outdoor activities safer with distancing and masking when they're close to those outside their household. Uh, indoor activities do pose a very substantial risk of transmission uh, and not just in that setting, in every other setting to which those people move uh, afterwards. With that, I'll move to a uh, quick view of the contributors uh, who've uh, helped with uh, this week's briefing and provided material. Uh, and then I'll close on the uh, uh, members of the consensus uh, table and the scientific advisory table uh, who've provided this information.